Imagine waiting two weeks to know if you got a like or not, or a thumbs up. In the decades before the internet, people made comics, and we reached out to each other. What was it like? This is the Sequential Artists Workshop, and these are the 90s mini comics, oral history archives. Come join us as we take a longer look at those analog days when communication was a lot slower, maybe more deliberate, maybe more reckless. Who knows? It was just different. Join us as we take a look and really notice how much things have changed. Come join us on the socials. Sometimes it's Comics Workshop, sometimes it's Saw Comics. Either way, come check us out and welcome. Hi, this is Tom Hart. We're really excited to include Roberta Gregory in these archives, the groundbreaking and legendary cartoonist. She is the first woman to self-publish a full-length solo comic, as far as I know, with Dynamite Damsels in 1976. And she's been involved in mini comics and self-publishing all throughout her entire career, even including recently. This was recorded in 2024, and uh, Roberta jumped right into the interview, so here we go. Oh, yeah, my Dynamite Jump Damsels, that came out in 1976. I found oh. a half a box of them. I'm not totally out of them like I thought. You, you did? Know. Oh, I didn't know yeah. you had extra copies. Are you selling them on your website? Oh, well, oh, my website's a mess. I mean, it's like, it is like so out of date. I mean, there's things that books that are out of date, I'm trying to get reprinted that people are still ordering, but um, eventually, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe after this, we can get in touch and I can order another Dynamite Damsels from Oh, you. sure. Yeah. Just, just contact. Oh yeah. All right. I've got, let's see. Hold on. I've got a few, brought a few show or things to remind myself or show and tells or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Comics FX. I've got a bunch of these, you know, those were basically oh, nice. oh my like, god i noticed you mentioned those yeah i've never yeah anyway um let's do real questions so you can actually use some of this you know <laughs> um okay i will uh let's see i want to um oh, i'm just out of the shower <laughs> yeah and again i appreciate you meeting early so so oh, sure uh, you know what i'm gonna put in the chat the question the first um eight questions, but then, but I'll ask, also ask you, um, let's find the chat. Um, chat. and it's okay if, uh, all right, there we go. So really we just start by, if you wouldn't mind, just state your name and, um, and where you, uh, where you're recording from and the date, and then some of the comics that you produced that you self-produced before the, the, um, the internet. So we're, we're more interested maybe in, in Dynamite Damsels and whatever collectives you might have been involved in and oh, winging sure, yeah. well, I mean like the winging it, Sheila and the Unicorn. I mean, I published all yeah. these, these books are all like pre, -inter you know, pre-internet. Hey. They're from the 80s. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't mind, name, sure. date, uh, and then tell us about those books and where you were, where you were when you were um, uh, producing those books. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think today is the 15th of March, the Ides of March, and I'm Roberta Gregory, um, and I am recording from, I am in Laconner, Washington, which is like a little town about an uh, hour and a half north of Seattle. Uh, I'm kind of in two places at once, but um, for now. And um, I've done a lot of self-publishing dating from the pre-internet era. Um, let's see, I've got Dynamite Damsels, this was like a regulation sized comic book that um, came out in 1976. Uh, let's see, I think then during the 80s, I published a few book books like, here's like Sheila and the Unicorn, which is like a little, I did a little story of, I mean, everybody back in the 80s, like comic newspaper comic strips were like the way to, you know, be a millionaire and of course now they're dropping like flies, but um, I didn't want to like draw a strip every day for the rest of my life because my creative output is all over the map. So I did a little story that um, had a beginning and an end all in little comic strips and I found the money to publish it. And I think this was like, I think 1986, I think, um, 1988. And the text inside, it's like typewriter text that was like, you know, Oh, it's basically like typewriter text that I Xerox down and then pasted to boards, you know, so it's very, I think this was probably press type, I think. And then winging it, I did a few books of 
these came out, I think in 1989, I started a little comic book series and realized that was not the way to go. This was 89. This was like the black and white comic boom. So I decided to just, I'd worked on this thing for years. So I decided to just put it all together. And I did one book that has the first half of the story. And then I think several years later, I published the second half. But yeah, these, this is all artwork. Again, the text inside are little blocks of uh, typewriter type that I shot down and, you know, probably either glue sticked or rubber cemented. I mean, I was doing, I was working in paste up with high tech, you know, high tech techniques like waxers and, you know, that you feed through these little machines with rollers, but I didn't have anything like that at home. So it's basically just probably typewriter text glue sticked down to boards that were the same size as the boards I drew. And of course the artwork is all just lines on paper or lines on Bristol board with, I think maybe some blue pencil underneath. So, you know, really high tech stuff. So everything is, everything is pretty handmade. Oh, what else? And then let's see, Naughty Bits, that was my series from Fanographics. Here is a, let's see, here's a characteristic uh, Naughty Bits comic book. I think the first issue came out in 19, let's see, 1991. I think was the first issue. And I think the last issue was 2003. And I was definitely not on Facebook. I don't know if even if Facebook was even in, you know, vast circulation in like the early 2000s. But uh, I certainly was. And I think I had an email address. So people, I think halfway through the series, instead of sending me letters by through my PO box, people could send me fan mail or questions or whatever by by the world wide web the internet i mean that was a big deal in the mid 90s i think i finally got my first computer in like 1998 i think or whatever um can you describe the those books that you just mentioned like what maybe just what genres you would call them oh let's see okay well um we'll not, not, or let's see, um, let's go back. Dynamite Damsels, that's a comic about the fem feminism. Uh, back in 19, back in the early 1970s, there was this thing called Women's Lib where women wa wanted things like birth control and jobs and being able to like buy a car without their husband's permission, you know, things like that. And um, this was like the humorous side. I was in college and there was this, line going around that feminists have no sense of humor. And I, I saw a lot of funny things going on. So this is a basically a little story of a very idealistic girl, Frida Phelps, who, um, you know, she kind of sees what's wrong with the world and tries to change it. And things don't always go, go her way. But um, yeah, this was printed at a, um, let's see, I think the, well, one interesting thing about the process is that I had this, this is like mass produced. I printed like 10,000 copies of it, which was a very small press run back in the underground comic days. And um, it was like the minimum. And I thought I was out of them for a long time, but I actually found a half a box in the middle of my moving. So that's cool. So there's, there's some left. There's also, I think, an online archive that has the whole thing on it somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, it's all just little little comic strips with you know, little gags about feminism and, you know, finding clothes that fit and, you know, protesting uh, sexism and so forth. So let's see. And then let's see, Sheila and the Unicorn. That was, like I say, it was just basically just a, it's just a little humorous comic strip. It's kind of drawn in a little cookie cutter style that was popular in the 80s where, you know, like I'm thinking of like tumbleweeds, like, you know, I was just trying to do like a typical strip, but it had a unicorn because like unicorns were, I think in the eighties, you know, the unicorns were on everything kind of like today, except, you know, no internet or no mass, no mass media. But, um, so I thought, oh, let's do a funny story strip with a unicorn. Of course, now there's, you know, what Phoebe's unicorn or whatever. So there actually is one that somebody's making a bundle off of, but I didn't want to, like I said, everything I did was different. Like I was doing humor, I was doing serious comics. So I just wanted, I just did like a little story in strips. I think it's like 74, pa 72 pages. And the story has a beginning and an end. So 
but that was fun. I mean, that was just to also to get people off my backs that were saying, you need to do a comic strip. You're not going to get anywhere with these comic books. Huh. Um, and then let's see, winging it. This is kind of fun. This was a spinoff of a strip or a story I did in gay comics. I was doing stories in women's comics and tits and clits and gay comics in these um, there were different, all these anthologies that were coming out in the late seventies and early eighties. And it's, uh, it's kind of hard to explain. It's kind of a story about a person who commits suicide and then all these events happen. And, um, well, it's hard to explain. I mean, it's, I mean, most people don't even get it, but it was, it was, it was a fun project that I was involved in for a long time. And I've actually now got a, um, I mean, I did the second issue, I finally finished it somewhere in the mid 90s. And I kind of came up with a sequel that I don't know if I'm ever going to do like the angel, the fallen angel character actually survives. And, you know, I had a scenario for this person. And um, I'm actually writing, there's like another little group of people that are in it that live on another world. And I've been writing an enormous novel that involves them. I mean, over the last 20 years, and that's the project I would like to, you know, get completed before I die, which, you know, since I'm 70, that's a little sooner than back in these days, but um, I need to do, write one more book and it'll, you know, that'll kind of tie up the story. So like I say, my projects, they might be in print and completed and, you know, you can still get a few cop in the, you can still get a few copies from me condition, but the stories, stories move on. I'm a, creative person and my like I say my creativity is kind of all over the map yeah, see definitely. what else oh and then there's naughty bits um naughty bits um let's see I start I was working for fanographics when I moved to Seattle they produce like the world's greatest cartoonists or whatever um everything I mean they were doing um let's see I need to turn this off um they were producing um I mean Indie comics, uh, they were Comics Journal. I think they were, uh, let's see, Amazing Heroes. I mean, they had, I think they even started like a porno line for a while, you know, so old, I mean, collections of historical comics. And I think I, this was originally gonna be a one shot. I just kind of wanted to do something that was, okay, this is like an indie fanographics comic with like this angry woman character and the first issue, um, it was sort of supposed to be like just a one-off and then it sold, bet I guess, better than they thought. So it's, oh, Gary said, oh, why don't you do another issue? So I kept doing stories with my character, Bitchy Bitch, and she kind of became a thing. She's been like, there was an animated cartoon that I didn't write that she was in for a while. She's been like in Germany and France and translated into, I think, Swedish and I think Finally, Chinese. I have no idea how that went over, but yeah, she's a really interesting, fun character that I can do a lot with. And I actually, in I think the mid '90s, I had a, a weekly strip running in. I think it was the Willamette Week and the Seattle Weekly. So this was fun. Also, this is little bitchy little comics with bitchy doing you know doing her bitchy best. And this was fun. This is also something I self published in the. Um, Let's see, is, oh, I've got actually, I've got actual type now. I think it looks like a Comic Sans. I think I moved past the um, typewriter text stage. So probably, I probably had this printed out at Fanographics or whatever. So at least it's less embarrassing than the other ones. And, what year and is that? I had that printed at a printer. I think it was Morgan, I think back in one of the printers that everybody was using back in the day. Morgan in, I think, North Dakota. So you mentioned so, you mentioned that um, Dynamite Damsels was ten thousand copies. How many were those later issues that you yourself published in the eighties and nineties? Oh well, these are books. I mean, like the um, let me think. What else? Um, oh, actually, I've also got I've got a print on demand book, but that that was the um, that's been in the um, post mm. um, post era. Let's see. Well, well, I've had I've had a lot of books of winging it. I mean, I think. Can't remember. It was like a few thousand. I mean, but these are like big fat books. So, you know, they, I think there's like 40 to a box or whatever. And I've still got a few, a couple of boxes of those. I think there were, um, they didn't go into mass. Well, 
Actually, dynamite damsels, it went into, it was carried by Last Gasp, which was one of the big distributors back then, or one of the only distributors back then. So it actually kind of got out in the world. And um, also when I published it, there were like a lot of women's bookstores that didn't last that long, but they were great while they stayed in business. And I'd mail off, a, there were you know, probably like a few dozen of them, and I'd mail off a copy to them and say, hi, this is the world's first feminist comic book, and you can sell it, just send me, I think they were a dollar each, so I said, send me like, what, six dollars, and I'll send you ten copies or whatever. It was a, that was the economics back then, and I got rid of a lot of them that way. Well, that's awesome. Uh, where were you living in some of these times? And Dana, you were in California, is that correct? Yeah, let's see. And I was living in Southern California. I think during Dynamite Damsels, I was in Long Beach. Uh, during, let's see, Sheila and Winging It, I was in the San Fernando Valley in Van Nuys. And then during the bitchy era, I was in Seattle. And I'm kind of in the process of moving out of Seattle right now. It's kind of taken forever because there's been a few disasters along the way. But Hopefully, by the end of the year, I will be completely out of Seattle. But. And and in the location you're now, which is? Uh, La Conner. It's like this little town that's um, up north of uh, Seattle. Very nice. It's, well, it's a long story. Like my partner, Bruce, um, he was have 25 years. He was having some major health issues and had to get out of the city. The condo is like kind of right in the city. And the city is like growing up fast around it. And. This is like a little. This is like a little little community that's on an Indian reservation. It's right by. I can almost see the bay here. I mean, I'm. I don't really have a view property, but like if I, you know, about 300 feet. If I threw a rock that went 300 feet, it would land in this cute little cove with bald eagles and such. So it's definitely out and out, kind of out in the boonies. But I've got neighbors like within spitting distance. So. But unfortunately, Bruce passed away two months after we moved, which uh, a couple of years ago, which kind of threw a monkey wrench into everything. So I've been kind of on my own trying to kind of using the last of my money and, you know, realizing I need to sell a condo in Seattle so I can like keep going. So right. then things keep coming up to and other people die. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of things keep coming up to put that off but on the other hand you know by the time I get around to it this year maybe the housing market will be in better shape so you know I can't fret about it too much right oh, that's I didn't point. expect to get COVID I'm finally getting over COVID oh. I've had COVID for about a month and I still have coughing fits and I still throw up unexpectedly so oh um, it's taking me a while to I made the mistake of having coffee with like a scone this morning and that really upset my stomach so yeah so now I'm just having coffee with nothing okay <laughs> well I've got quite a few more questions I'm oh good 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 let's get going yeah okay. Sorry. <laughs> sure. um you're gonna we, edit like crazy I can see right now we might not edit I might just let <laughs> just let me yeah yammer yeah, yeah good um, sure so we're we're curious about everybody's first um the, the first evidence they saw that people that other people were making comics and how that inspired how that might have inspired you to make comics like when did that you flash? mean now you mean producing them or no, just making them creating. drawing them oh gosh well probably the big thing was I mean well I grew up with comics because my dad worked for Disney I mean he wrote and drew uh penciled uh comics for all I mean since the 1950s or late 1950s I mean I've got I've got all of his crap here too. I've got like his paintings and like a millions of copies of old gold key comics and such. But uh, yeah, so I, I mean, we always had com. I mean, uh, like he was right in my home. I mean, my dad was, you know, in the back room or I think when I was little, he was in the little, little studio built off the garage and making comics. So I, I knew right away that people, other people did co created comics, but you know, he was doing work for hire. But um, I mean, I read them all. While I was, you know, all while I was, while I was growing up, I mean, had Spider Man back in the, you know, the, I think the first one I think was like issue fifteen, you know, Archie and my dad got tons of comics shipped to him, so of course I read all of those, all the old gold gold key comics, but um, I mean, well, the big, um, 
I mean, I was actually writing and drawing my own little comic stories back then too, um, that I figured nobody was ever gonna see while I was in like middle school and high school. And uh, I think I've still got a few of those somewhere in boxes, somewhere either here or in Seattle, I'm not sure. But like I say, the big revelation was finding women's comics, issues of comics by women when I went to college in 1971. I mean, there was, Trina had her, uh, like a, she had what, Girl Fight Comics, I think. There was uh, women's comics. I think that was, let's see, 1971. I think it was probably a couple of years later that I actually, because I was kind of doing, my, doing comics for people in college uh, that I had kind of a, you know, small readership for that. But yeah, I discovered women's comics and I realized people are doing all kinds of comics, especially women. Women are doing all kinds of comics, like comics about real life and comics about the worst things that happened to them and so forth. And so that so, was a huge revelation that you could do just about anything. So what would have been the first anthology you contributed to after? Uh, oh, definitely women's comics. I mean, that was issue number four. I did like a really badly drawn story that, you know, kind of made, didn't make a lot. Now that I read it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but they liked it. I mean, because they're, they're, they're happy to get women to contribute. So I did a few more stories for that. I did some when Tits and Clits turned into an anthology in the late 70s. I did stories for them also. So yeah, it was, it was a really good way. I mean, there wasn't, we didn't have like internet, but on the other hand, people were kind of looking out for these comics and they wanted to get them. And once they got them, your work is going to be in them. So it was actually kind of a good way to get distributed. I mean, because people were, you know, people knew there was a series and there was like another issue coming out. So, you know, they'd go to their head shop or wherever, I don't think they, I don't know if they even, I guess they must have had comics, specific comic stores back in the early 70s, but um, we we got them all from head shops. I mean, they were like, that was pretty much the local distributor for underground comics. Were most of your um, professional friendships uh, through the mail or were there a lot of parties involved? Or were you in the same cities? Well, let's see. Um, <clears throat> well, I lived in, I lived in Long Beach. I was going to school in the Long Beach, which is kind of a sub suburb of LA. And I met, um, I actually hung out with uh, Joyce Farmer and Lynn Shevley. They were in Laguna Beach. They started putting out, I think their, the, their first issue, I think of, what was it? Tits and Clits, I think. I came out about, it was like something like a week before the first issue of women's comics or something. It's like they were um, like women's comics and Trina, they were all based in San Francisco, which is like way north of me. And um, Lynn and Joyce were in Laguna Beach, which was a bit south of me. And you know, in the middle of the underground comic era, um, for some reason, these two disparate groups of women decided they need there needed to be comics by women available. And I think the each of their premier issues came out very close to each other and they they weren't in communication or anything they just this all just sort of evolved you know simultaneously which is pretty interesting yeah. of course i mean you know people are still in the same world and you're still seeing getting the same information although not at the lightning speed that we get information these days so but, you know, things got done and people knew what was going on and people communicated. It was just at a different speed. Um, and you said, so Dynamite Damsels was 1976. At what point did you realize you wanted to make a full a full length comic of your own? Oh, that was Dynamite Damsels. Um, well, I think, let's see, I think I, let's see, I had a story in women's comics number four. And then I think I submitted another, I think it was issue number five. And I think they turned it down because they, but they said something like it was too much like the other story. Um, I'm not really sure, but that kind of made me realize, well, gee, you know, like they're not gonna print everything of mine, but if I have my own comic book, you know, I can do anything I want. So 
I think I had gone to San Francisco to some, there was some sort of a comics event. And I remember talking to Ron Turner uh, at Last Gasp, who was this distributor of, I mean, if there's any kind of an event, it's a comic event in San Francisco, Ron Turner is gonna be there. And he made some comment that, you know, well, if there was like a, you know, it would be great to have like a full length comic, you know, feminist comic or whatever. So I was thinking, okay, you know, I can, I can kind of crank these out in my, oh, I was in college, but you know, there, there was this thing called the summer where you didn't have to go to college, didn't have to go to classes. So I think I did most of Dynamite Damsels in I think the summer of 1975. Summer of 1975. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Cause it came out in 76. So I was Yeah, because 19, 1974, that's when I first came up with the character Frida, because she um, she was a little character in a comic strip that ran in the Women's Resource Center newsletter, Women People. So um, oh. that's where she started out. So I basically just kind of expanded her uh, adventures into like an entire, well, there, there are also some other stories too. There was like a, you know. Tell us about was, that. Oh, go ahead. Huh? Oh, no, like the, there was a story, Super Dyke, which was like a lesbian superhero character that was also in the comic. And then I think I did a fict fictitious story about the first women, all women's colony or whatever. So um, it wasn't all Frida's um, tales, but uh -huh. um, and then I think also I did s some stories with her in Tits and Clits. So there was one story where she starred in another anthology. Can you tell us about the Women's Resource Center newsletter? Was What was that? Oh, that was just in college. That was just like a mimeographed something that came out, you know, it's talking about classes and demonstrations and what was going on in the news. And, oh, let's see, somewhere, I mean, I can't, if I was back in Seattle, I could probably find it. But I decided to do a little strip called Feminist Funnies, and the star was Frida. And I think there was... Um, they were just little like three panel gags having to do with, you know, feminism. She'd say something and somebody else would say something else. But um, yeah, I can, eventually when everything is in one place, I could probably dig some up. I think I've got a few that are like, you know, a little scrapbook or something. I save everything. <laughs> um, so we want to ask you about some of your some of uh, your peers and other people you consider peers, either um, either in the 70s or 80s or 90s, any of them, and, and how did uh -huh. you meet them? And um, tell us if you worked together, did tabling together, uh, trips together, things like that. Oh, let's see. Um, let's see, during the um, <clears throat> 70s, um, Let's see, I think I went to San Francisco a few times to meet people in person like Trina and Shelby Sampson. And I it interacted a lot with Joyce and Lynn because they were they lived nearby. So they were probably my major peers during the seven like 70s and early 80s. And um yeah, I think let's see, I remember I think in the early 80s, that was the gay comics days. I remember going to San Francisco and visiting with Robert Triptow, who was one of the contributor, he was one of the editors, I think, um, since after issue number five, I think. So, um, but I mean, I had some peers in college too, like Phil Ye, he's a, he's kind of a well-known cartoonist and he does car cartoonists across America and does literacy programs. He was, um, he had a, newspaper, tabloid paper that I contributed a lot of comics to. So, and he had a, I think a little gallery, cobblestone gallery in one of the little more, more boho neighborhoods of uh, Long Beach. So yeah, kind of, we, I kind of hung out with them and um, they put out, I think a comic book collection. So yeah, there was, and also I think, um, I didn't know at the time, but Mary Fleener, she was attending the same university I was at the same time, but I think she was in a different department. So everybody, everybody was around, but like you, I mean, you 
actually like visited people. You didn't, um, you, you weren't connected by the internet. You had to like call and, oh, let's, you know, oh, there's a opening at the gallery. Why don't you come on down? Okay. Or they were putting together one of their publications. We'd get together and help do paste up and all the myriad kind of uh, grunt work it takes to, it, well, well, all the, all the grunt work it took back in the 70s and 80s to get publications out into the world. Now it's all like pixels or whatever. Stuff I don't know how to do. I mean, I am completely inept when it comes to like, well, I'm not quite inept in coloring. I mean, if somebody shows sets me up and shows me how to do it, I could. But if I'm on my own, I'm lost. So I'm definitely, I'm definitely low tech. How much, how much trading and selling and stuff like that did you do in the mail, mini comics or anything like that? Oh, let's see. Um, well, I'd sell. Um, let me think. Um, well, I think it was in the. Let's see, I had dynamite damsels. I was selling those mostly to um, either other comic stores or the women's bookstores. Um, like the, oh, that's right, in the late 80s, when I was publishing Sheila and my Winging It books, I had a lot of interaction with people through Comics FX, which I think you actually mentioned. So, so people must know about it anyway. Here's an, here's an issue, one of the, I mean, it's backwards, I mean, but... Um, yeah, it's a, I've got a little stack of them upstairs. I just brought one down. This is from issue number six, December, 1988. And it also looks like, here we go. Women cartoonists meet in Seattle. Several women cartoonists familiar to small press enthusiasts will be in attendance at a special panel to be held November 13th at CenterCon at the Seattle Center. New women in comics. So it's me and Donna Barr. And let's see, well, I guess that was us. I guess it was basically me and Donna Barr, but uh, that was my first visit to Seattle from California. And back then Seattle was like, it's like a place where you could do well on very little income, which it definitely is not anymore. This was, you know, like what, 30, 36 years ago or whatever, but um, that inspired me to move. Plus I got a job, Fanographics was still located in, California and um, they they did they I mean my one skill was antiquated paste up like I worked for I worked for magazine publishers like dark room spending hours and hours I mean instead of scanning things back in the day you went to the dark room with this gigantic camera you had to like hand crank in order to make a picture smaller so it could be pasted up on the board or if you wanted to turn a glossy photograph into a half tone you had to you spent a long time wrestling with these screens that you know you, to to get an even um you know dot pattern half tone pattern through it which was about my least favorite thing to do and then you're locked up with all of these toxic chemicals you had to run the photographic paper through in order to and then hoping it exposed the right amount of time. So I spent a lot of time doing that at, for different magazine publishers and at Fantagraphics. And then of course, just like paste up and artwork and doing charts and everything that was drawn by hand or you know, had little shapes cut out of film in order to have a color overlay on something. So I was doing the same kind of you know crap for Fantagraphics because they were this was like the late eighties and they were at the same level of technology. And um, I moved to Seattle when they did in May 1989. So that was when I moved to Seattle with Fanographics. But like I say, I already knew, like I knew, I already knew Ed Vick and probably a lot of these people that are, you know, a lot of these Seattle people. Oh, I also knew Colin Upton. I went to visit him, I think, when I was, he was in, he's in Vancouver, which is just to the north of us in Canada. Yeah, so. This was Comics FX was like a huge, that was a huge help in creating a community. So pretty much when I moved to Seattle, I already had a community. And um, another thing was I would have a lot of parties like um, 
David Lasky was just visiting here just a few days ago, and um, he's teaching at the little, well, it's like a high school and middle school and elementary school because it's a small town, but he was a guest instructor, and he reminded me, uh, so I had some of my friends from the art circle here over, and he was reminding them that, you know, when I was in C Seattle during the 90s, I mean, I would have parties all the time. He said that that was how you met people is, you know, Roberta would, she'd have a party and people would all come and exchange information and such. So that was fun. So I still like doing that. When Bruce and I were in Seattle, I mean, we'd have about three or four gatherings and I'm trying to kind of get that going here in this small town, which there's a lot of creative people. So I've got, I've got hopes and I've got a lot of nice neighbors too. Wow. So yeah, a lot of things were done in person. Yeah. I love that you said, uh, my, my only skill was antiquated paste up. That'll, that'll be. Oh good. yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so, so, Boy, what do I want to ask after that? Uh, Comics FX was after Fact Sheet Five. Were you ever involved with Fact Sheet Five? No, I didn't. I didn't know anything about. I really didn't know anything about Fact Sheet Five. I wasn't mm -hmm. involved with it. But you saw, yeah, Comics FX. That's that's wild that they were advertising that um, that event that was happening at the at a convention. Sure. Yeah. That like I said, that was my first visit to yeah. visit to Seattle. Yep. Let's yeah. Here's I mean it's full of um, fat fanographics to move to Seattle. I mean these are oh, just all. Oh, I never yeah. Here's the what does it say here? It says fanographics books has announced it is moving its entire operation, including staff, editors, writers, and other employees, to Seattle in early 1989. Let's see. There we go. Yeah. And then of course once it was in Seattle, everybody had to work there. I mean I don't you know. I'm not present company excluded, I don't know, but just about everybody like had some kind of a gig at the Seattle location. New building has already been leased just north of Vienna. Yeah, really. Okay, interesting. Yep. Well, yeah, this is this is where you found out what was going on was Comics FX. I've got to go back to that little stack of comics downstairs and see what else is in here. So anyway, if you have that. Do you have extras huh? of any of those comics FX? Do you have I don't know about extras, extras, mm -hmm. but I've got, let's see, yeah. I don't know. I'll have to see if there's any duplicates because these things are pretty wild. Yeah, they definitely need to be, you know, I mean, I've got, I mean, I've got so much stuff that needs to go somewhere. I mean, I've got all of my dad's ephemera. I mean, I've got um, all of his aerospace paintings and I've got tons of my stuff. So I don't know. I've got to figure out what to do with this when I'm no longer here to try to keep it organized send it to the billy ireland i think sure yeah probably <laughs> um so you did a lot of self publishing and self distribution did you ever want to team up with other people and form a collective distribution system or anything like that it, well, it like always seemed like it always seemed like a good idea but um i don't know it just never never really worked out you seem like a a, a do it yourself kind of person and when things don't get done you just do it instead of waiting sure, for yeah. things to happen. Well, I did a few like small press comics, but um, like, you know, Xerox, but um, they say I probably advertised them. Well, another thing is once I had Naughty Bits, the first issue of Bitchy Bitch came out in um, uh, 1991, like the back pages, I'd advertise other people's comics. Like, yeah. um, I don't have any the early issues are all downstairs but you know i'd have a back, a page where you know people would mail me their mini comics or small press comics and i'd stick a little image and go oh you can get patty lighty's you know um so what is what was it i think it was zero hour comic for just you know contact her or send you know three dollars to her p.o box or whatever you know i had pages full of those and that was always fun too so again i was kind of helping yeah people just kind of connected with other people with whatever you know media or format or communication device you had and um you know mm -hmm. things things got done and 
if you saw the boxes of mini comics and old press and things I have, I mean, things, things got to where they needed to go. <laughs> what about festivals? Did you go to many? Convention? Oh, let me think. Let's see. Festivals. Um, well, I went, I know I went to San Diego Con Comic Con, I think. Let's see. When did I, I mean, I definitely went after Naughty Bits was published. I think I went, um, just trying, let's see, I, I'm not sure. I think I was in too too much in the process of moving to go when in the late 80s, but I definitely went a lot to in for several times in the 1990s. I remember when Fanographics we all went to Angoulême and then when um plus there were comics events in Seattle like the CenterCon, like the little conventions at the Seattle Center like the one that was mentioned in Comics FX. So I kind of do that occasionally. I mean, I really, I only have that much, too much, I don't have too much tolerance for just like sort of sitting somewhere at a table and hoping somebody's going to walk by and buy something. I mean, but, <laughs> but I mean, it's fun. I mean, I think now I have more fun. Just, I figure if somebody needs, really needs to get one of my books, they can track me down somehow or other with the magic of the internet. So I kind of have more fun just sort of, going to events now instead of being at events and trying to sell. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, let me ask you two more questions. One is, what do you miss about the time before the internet? And what? And the other question is, what do you not miss about that time? Oh, let's see, well, I, let's see, what do I miss? Well, it just seemed like a lot of fun. I mean, I didn't, um, I mean, you could live on nothing back then. So I wasn't really under pressure to, you know, make a lot of income so I could like stay in one place. But um, I don't know, like I say, it just seemed like, well, I was also younger too. That had a lot to do with it too, but life just seemed a lot more fun back then. Um, but don't I miss, well, I guess I don't miss, um, it was kind of, you know, everything took, everything took a lot longer. I mean, it's, I just can't imagine what things would have been like back then if we'd had something like an internet or like Facebook where you pop something up for, you know, what, 4,000 people to see within or however much Facebook lets, allows. Um, but yeah, it just seems like, it just seems like another world. I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, what's it like growing up with AI imagery? <laughs> Yeah, how do you know what's even real anymore? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll if you've got any other anecdotes, I'd love to hear one. Maybe just some event that you didn't tell us about or some Oh gosh, let me think. Um any anecdotes. Well I'm sure once I once we log off, I'll have plenty of them. So you might want to visit later on. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. can, um okay, cool. Well, this is mostly most Does of that help? Yeah, this is mostly what I wanted to collect, and there's a lot of information. One one question I didn't ask you about, we yeah. could go there, I guess, is about just what kind of materials you were drawing with. Um, oh, it, um, let's see. Well, let's see. I think, let's see, Dynamite Damsels, I think this was a, this was like a dip pen. Um, let's see. I think when I got around to Bitchy Bitch, um, let's see, what's this? Yet, this looks... This is kind of stiff. This kind of look, well, I guess, yeah, I think I started using a Rotring pen. Those are like these German, like, they're like fountain pens that you can fill with like, you know, regular ink, not runny fountain pen ink and draw with those. So everything bitchy is, um, I got my scritchy bitchy line with um, those pens. I think Sheila, let's see. I'm thinking this might have been drawn with rapidograph because I was really trying to get this kind of, you know, cookie cutter stiff sort of, I mean, it's kind of, I think part of the reason I didn't do it that long was that it was kind of an unappealing style just because it was just kind of repetitive and stiff looking. But I think this was done with rapidograph, which a lot of people used back then before because they just didn't know any better. 
you're very fast too it seems like i think you've always been a fast cartoonist is that true? oh um not nece not necessarily i mean Prolific. like when i was doing doing cranking out 40 issues of naughty bits i mean i usually sort of come up with an idea because you have to solicit it like what three or four months ahead of publication date and then i just kind of you know sit around for another month and not wonder how how i was going to write a story about bitchy going on vacation and then i think maybe about a month before i would suddenly okay here's the story in my head sit down dash it out on like a little tablet or whatever and then get down to drawing it and well like I say, Bitchy was kind of a prod, prod, product rather than art, like winging it. That was, I was really fussing over every, I mean, I think I penciled and then I, you know, tried to use like a light table and finally got sick of that. But like the art in winging it is really fussy, but uh, Bitchy Bitch was like fun just because I was like just turning it out for a deadline and the, you know, more manic and scritchy it got, the more it enhanced the storylines, which are also pretty manic and scritchy. So it kind of just kind of evolved. All right. Last last question is can you can you give us uh three or four people we should we should interview for this same topic? Oh gosh. Um let me think. Well have you done Colin Upton yet? Not yet. Is he easy? Oh to he he was he was like the king of mini comics back then. He I mean he he had like a whole um I think I knew him back in the 90s back when I still had a passport um let's see um yeah he um oh yeah definitely Colin Upton I mean he's yeah he he's done like dozens and dozens of mini comics and I think he still is actually so yeah he's he he would definitely be the the person let me think I don't know who you who who haven't you who have just, you spoken to huh? just getting started so we haven't gotten too many people gosh right? okay well Let's see. Well, maybe Donna Barr. She's 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 definitely she she she'll t she'll keep you busy. She, <laughs> she, she has a lot to she has a lot to say and a lot of opinions. Let's yeah. see who else. Oh gosh, small press. Um, you, I think I saw you did David Lasky, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of drawing a blank. I'm just trying to think of people that are small press um i know ed vick had a he had a little publishing company but that's back in the 90s early I'll reach out to ed as well i, I haven't uh -huh. talked he might, well he might know people too i mean Bruce Chris he Lips. knows a lot of people in the like funny animal community i think okay. um, yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of energy there i mean like they were i mean as much as people kind of sneer at funny animal cartoonists i mean they you know they're motivated and they get a lot done. Um, let me think. Um, well, like I guess I'll probably think of somebody who wants it. Yeah, that's fine. Feel free to that's email me. Breakfast. Yeah. Yeah, after a little more food or any time. Oh, definitely, definitely Colin Upton. I mean, he, he definitely, I mean, he, oh. he distributed, he, I mean, every time I visited him, I mean, he was getting photocopies made. I mean, awesome. going to book the comic stores and dropping things off. So. He was, okay. yeah. We'll go to Colin next. Roberta, thanks so much. You're, you're, oh, you bet. If you need right. any, need, need to know anything else, let me know. Okay, I will. And I, I hope everything goes well with your move. You're such oh, an inspiration too. to so many people. I just want to thank you for, you know, 30, hmm? 40. I just want to thank you for all the work you've done in this medium. It's been, amazing. oh, there's, oh, there's more. I mean, there's so much I want to do that I probably won't get or ever get around to doing in this lifetime. It's criminal, but I'm, like I say, once, once things kind of stabilize um, and I get some income again, I'll be back, back in the saddle. All right. Thanks so Thanks. much. All you right. bet. Yay, Roberta. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. This is the 80s, 90s pre-internet mini comics oral history archives. This is a project of the Sequential Artist Workshop, or SAW. You can find out more about this project or about the courses we offer, the programs we offer in comics and visual literacy and graphic novels at sawcomics.org. That's S-A-W-C-O-M-I-C-S dot org. You can find out how to support this project through the donate button. You can also support us on Patreon at Saw Comics. 
You can find more of this on our YouTube channel or through various places where you get your podcasts. You can find archives of this at the University of Florida and at our other partner institutions. And waving at you from the past, this is Tom Hart, the director of the Sequential Artist Workshop. Thanks so much for listening.